Welcome to the Love and Guts podcast. So why should we care about the vaginal microbiome? And just how different is the vaginal microbiome to the gut microbiome? Today, I'm delving into this topic with Dr. Jason Horlack. I've had this fabulous man on the show before, and we chatted about all things pre and probiotics and the gut microbiota. This podcast, episode 15, being one of my most loved and downloaded. So if you haven't listened to it yet, please make sure you do. But for those that aren't familiar with Jason, Dr. Jason Horlack is a research scientist, educator, naturopath, and Western herbalist with more than 18 years clinical experience. Jason practices at Gould's Natural Medicine, a 136-year-old natural medicine apothecary and clinic located in central Hobart. He did his honors and PhD degrees examining the causes of dysbiosis and the capacity of probiotics, prebiotics, and herbal medicines to modify the gut microbiome, and has written extensively in the medical literature on these topics, including 16 textbook chapters. He is on the Medical Nutrition Council of the American Society for Nutrition and was recently awarded a fellowship from the American College of Nutrition for his significant contributions to the teaching and practice of nutrition in Australia and North America. Jason is also a fellow of the Naturopaths and Herbalists Association of Australia. He is Chief Research Officer at ProbioticAdvisor.com, which offers a searchable database that enables easy, evidence-based prescribing of probiotic products and online resources for clinicians and health-conscious members of the public to learn more about the human microbiome and how they can positively influence these ecosystems. And if you're a practitioner and you've not joined Probiotics Advisor yet, I highly, highly recommend that you do. But in this episode, we cover what makes up a healthy vaginal ecosystem, what bacteria dominate the vaginal ecosystem, what are the five community states of the vaginal ecosystem, what might a dysbiotic vaginal microbiome be comprised of, how does the vaginal microbiome differ throughout a woman's life cycle, how the vaginal microbiome differs from the gut microbiome. What are some causes of vaginal dysbiosis? What does leaky vagina mean and how does it impact our health? What Jason has used effectively in the treatment of bacterial vaginosis? Why do we love lactic acid in the vagina so much? How do we assess vaginal health? And so much more. We go down the rabbit hole of so many things, vaginal microbiome. This episode is sponsored by Better Me Tea, a tea designed to promote improved gut health and digestion, assisting those who struggle with constipation and sluggish bowel movements to go to the bathroom with ease. And as always, I do like to mention that this information is not intended to diagnose or treat a medical condition. So please ask your health practitioner before beginning any new treatment. And if you love what you hear today, I would love it if you could leave a ratings and review on iTunes so that others can find love and guts easily and can enjoy the content too. Hi, Jason. I'm so excited to get you back on love and guts. I had you on the show before and we chatted about all things pre and probiotics and the gut microbiota. And actually this podcast being one of my most loved and downloaded, if you guys haven't checked it out, it's episode 15. But today I'm welcoming you back on to talk about the vaginal microbiome. And I'm so excited to talk about this topic, but I'm, I'm, I must confess, I did not think I'd be having this conversation with the male. So <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> welcome, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. And um, I love the gut microbiome. That's my first passion. But uh, the vagina microbiome is also is like, I'd say my second, second passion. And I think it's, it's, it's an area that that is just beginning to be get the research that it deserves and and um and i think soon you know vaginal microbiome assessment will be part and parcel of a regular checkup um for your health as will gut ecosystem checking too but i think the as we'll as we'll get into the the consequences of um you know a dis dysbiotic vaginal ecosystem are actually quite quite significant for women and and it's not always associated with symptoms and that's the problem that yes if you get symptoms you might get checked out but as we'll, we'll be touching on i'm sure there are you know a, a dis, lots of dysbiotic environments where they have negative health consequences but no symptoms so mm-hmm. so women have no idea that they're actually experiencing this and that's 
you know, in, in the long term, there's a number of disease sequelae that are associated with it, but no acute symptoms. Mm, and after doing your vaginal microbiome um, course, part one, when is part two coming out? It's when I can find the time. I've got another <laughs> just five. Just putting a rocket up your butt for that because I loved it. <laughs> I've got another six to do in, in September, October. So wow. it's sometime after that where I can find the right headspace to to devote to it. Mm. And, and after doing your the part one of the vaginal microbiome course, it is a fascinating topic and I do see why you and I see it as a big part of something that should be an, an assessment for our patients. Yeah. Yeah. So what? let's get straight into it. What makes up a healthy vaginal ecosystem? Yeah, if you would have asked that question, you know, 20 years ago, it would have been, oh, it's an acidophilus dominated ecosystem or that one. And, and, and as you'll probably remember, at one point in time, all probiotics were referred to as acidophilus. Yes. <laughs> I took acidophilus for this. And that's that was a probiotic. There was only yeah, one. Yeah, and yes. it used to drive me mad because, like, <laughs> it's a single species. You can't call the whole mm. category of therapeutic agents by single species names. It's crazy. Mm. Um, and it's, we've moved along, thank God. So we're now calling it probiotics. Um, so that's good. But it used to be seen that the vaginal ecosystem was dominated by lactobacillus acidophilus and, and with more, again, changes in technology have allowed us to realize that, uh, no, it's certainly dominated by lactobacilli, um, but very rarely does acidophilus itself play a, any sort of key role in that ecosystem. It's usually one of um, a number of lactobacilli species that we find there, four of which tend to dominate, which are lactobacillus crispatus, lactobacillus inners, gensenii, and gesseri tend to be the dominant ones, but there's also lactobacillus vaginalis, fermentum, and Johnsonii, they're often found in um, the vaginal ecosystem as well. So what else makes up the, the healthy vagino, vagino, Jesus, I'm, I'm thinking about, <laughs> the, it's the Australian coming out of me. It is. What, <laughs> so what else makes up the healthy vaginal uh, ecosystem? So the, in regards to say the pH and the diversity, because yeah, it is very question. different to the, the gut microbiota, it's, isn't it's it? It's very different. So, so we certainly want, um, Yes, an ecosystem dominated by lactobacilli, and we'll get into the different community state types shortly, I'm sure. Um, and we want one essentially that has a low low pH associated with it too. Um, and that's, I think, for us, thankfully, as clinicians and, and, and as patients to a very um, quick marker um, that we can actually use to assess the health of an ecosystem is by ch checking the pH because I, a healthy vaginal ecosystem will always have a pH of less than 4.5. And we can pretty much guarantee there being a dysbiotic environment when the pH is greater than 4.5. So it's a very quick and easy screening test that can, can then we might have to follow it up with more testing, sure, but it's a very quick and easy one to go, okay, well, if you're in the healthy range, great. If you're not, then we know definitively that, that there's an issue there, even if you don't have symptoms. Mm. And that lack of diversity rather than lots of diversity is actually considered healthy, isn't it? Rather than, yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah, comparison complete to the opposite. Yeah, for the gut, it's like the more diverse and complex, the better. For the vaginal system, it's the opposite. We really want it to be dominated by, you know, one <laughs> lactobacilli species mm -hmm. making up 98% of what's there is sort of like the ideal with a handful of other species present. Whereas if, you know, if you've got 50 species in the vagina of a, of a, uh, that are spread out at, you know, 12 or 15%, which might be great in the gut, is totally not the case in the vagina. We really want it to be dominated very much by, by, by lactobacilli and one single species of lactobacilli too, ideally. Mm. And we do like the Lactobacillus crispatus, don't we? Why do we love that one so much? Yeah, um, I think for for a few reasons. One of which we we know that there's been a number of studies that have come out showing that women that have an ecosystem dominated by that one Lactobacillus type, Lactobacillus crispatus, have essentially the lowest risk of developing. STIs or STDs, lowest risk of getting cervical cancer, uh, lowest risk of getting bacterial vaginosis. It's the most stable ecosystem. And essentially think of, of L. crispatus as uh, a toughie. <laughs> it doesn't share space well. It doesn't like any other species coming into its turf. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there aren't other lactobacilli like lactobacillus inners is not like that. It's pretty piss weak and <laughs> will mm -hmm. allow lots of other things to come into its turf, sadly. Um, and also with crispatus, it produces a lot of lactic acid, so it creates um, essentially what we consider to be the most acidic sort of vaginal uh, pH environment of all those sort of community state types. Um, and that low pH that we get with a crispatus dominant ecosystem essentially spells death to invaders. So that will be things like viral pathogens, like even HIV and HP, um, the HPV. Mm -hmm. And um, we know that 
there's lots of research done in, in Africa looking at, at you know sex workers who are obviously at high risk of HIV that women have a, that have a crisp bodice dominated ecosystem have a far lower rate of risk of developing uh, and getting AIDS and it's just like wow mm -hmm. you know, there's still the same sort of sex practices what's different is what's dominating the vaginal ecosystem and how how strong and potent or what sort of guardian they have looking after that ecosystem and if you've got a crispatus one it's 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 very good and it tends to be very stable whereas some other ecosystems particularly one that's dominated by lateral um, inners is not very stable so it shifts around a little bit more during the cycle for example yeah and uh you call that the the transitional Yes. Yeah, yeah, the transitional type. And let's get into the types, the community states, because I want to uh, dig a bit deeper into these different forms and especially looking at the what, uh, say, a dysbiotic picture might look like um, versus the, say, the one that we want to kind of cultivate in the vagina. So you mentioned that there's five community states of the vaginal ecosystem. And why have they called it community states? I guess yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting, obvious. It's interesting terminology. I, I would I would probably call it ecosystem type yes, myself. Yeah. And I think that might have a, a more familiar ring to it. And maybe an analogy would, would be like a forest type, like it might have a tropical rainforest or, a, you know, it's a certain versus a pine forest. They're like, you know, distinct species that are present in that sort of ecosystem. Um, but what was fascinating with some some pretty pivotal research published uh, 2011, I think it was, that showed that that pretty much all women can, their ecosystems in the vagina can be, can be will come, enter into one of those five categories. And this is, I think, quite Different than guts, which I think the ecosystems are far more complex and much harder to, to actually put into those sort of categories, um, though people have tried. Um, but I think with vagina, it's, it's very clear that women will fit into one of these these types. And yeah, so we have uh, ecosystem type one, which is donored by lactose crispatus, and that occurs in about 25% of women. So, you know, one in four women will have, you know, that sort of ideal ecosystem type, which is great. Mm. You know, um, and that's, you know, it's the least likely to develop bacterial vaginosis or STIs and even better birth outcomes, too. We know that they're, they're more likely to, to get pregnant, have an easier time getting pregnant, um, a better chance of, of carrying baby to the full term. You know, so there's, there's a number of research studies exploring the benefits of having that community type uh, ecosystem. So I think there, there will be, once this research filters out into practice, there's going to be a big push for, for assessment of vaginal ecosystem health oh, and also for, for changing it. Yeah, because there's there's a number of, of, I think, pivotal women's health issues that are tied up here that, that relate to that vaginal ecosystem type. And and it's been, as an area that's been neglected far, far too long, and we now have enough data, I think, to actually start moving and changing that scenario. Mm, so, yeah, yeah so yeah. Moving, moving back, community state type one is crispatus. Community state type two is dominated by lactobacillus gasseri, and that makes up a pretty small percentage, about 6% of women. And that's uh, considered to be quite a good ecosystem, too. It's, it's a pretty stable ecosystem. Um, it rarely tra transitions through to anything else, and it also has a pretty good pH, you know, lactic acid production. Um, and then community state type three is actually the most, most common in that it occurs in, in probably about a third of women. 34% in that sort of pivotal research study. And this is one that's dominated by lactobacillus um, inners. And we know that that the species is present in small amount in, all, in pretty much all women. It's just that it very much dominates in, in these these in these women that that have the community state type three. And and the problem is is that the the inners, as I said before, um, doesn't really prevent bad guys or invaders pathogens from from coming into the territory it doesn't produce enough lactic acid to to create an environment that kills off the viruses and bacteria that are wanting to invade the tissue and we know that women that have a uh, lactose inner dominant ecosystem um, essentially have a higher risk of getting bacterial vaginosis about getting hpv infection and cervical dysplasia so why do you think that that this type inners is more common do you know I think they're still teasing that out, but I, I, I do think it's got to do with essentially – my thinking is, is it's the factors that cause a dysbiotic environment mm -hmm. that essentially create this more transitional state. And then if we have another dysbiotic event occur, <laughs> we never sort of transit back out into a healthier state. Um, and I think it's for a lot of women, they may get stuck there because they might be taking a course of antibiotics every six months. And that might be enough to, to essentially prevent that ecosystem from from settling into a crispatus dominated and there, there's possibly also genetics that come into it too or not genetics sorry uh it's what you're seeded with too that if your mom was crispatus dominated then maybe you'll be more likely to be crispatus dominated and i think some of those things haven't been teased out 
yeah. so well. Well, I look forward to hearing that... about that research and, and I yeah. can't wait to get into some of the causes of um, vaginal dysbiosis a little bit further on down the track um, so we can be mindful of that. But yeah. The type 4, the dysbiotic type 4, um, interests me a little bit, so I'd love to know a little bit more about that type. Yeah, because it's still very, see? very common. It's like, you know, 20 to 30 percent of healthy, I'll put quotation marks on that, women will, will have this community state type. And so it's not symptomatic. And and it's essentially a this is where you, a very diverse ecosystem where there's only small amounts of lactobacilli and you'll have a spread of other species like Gardnerella, Atopoeum and Prevotella, and sometimes things like E. coli, Streptococci and, and, and fecal bacteria too, that, are, that, are, that I'd like seeing in the gut. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily like seeing, you know, Roseburia and Blotia crows in the vagina. It's <laughs> like, you don't need butyrate producing bacteria. There. No. Wrong, wrong spot. So it tells that the ecosystem yeah, is out of balance. And when they've got that, there's essentially very little lactic acid being produced. And that lactic acid is key for killing off invading pathogens, as I said before, um, as well as just the health of vaginal cells too, because it, it's a a pretty amazing environment, I think, in, in, in one respect compared to, to, to the gut ecosystem because the, the gut bacteria are, for the most part, reliant upon our food for their nutritional needs. Yeah. You know, yes, some of them eat a little bit of mucus, yeah. But the vaginal ecosystem, are, the vagina is actually, you know, feeding bacteria specifically, and it's really trying to nourish those, those lactobacilli. So, it, you know, vaginal cells secrete some glycogen, which is the type of sugar, but it this, I'll say awareness. There's an awareness that that not all lactobacilli you know, consume glycogen, so it actually secretes some digestive enzymes to break down that glycogen into smaller sugars that lactobacilli can eat. And it's 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 amazing that I mean I always see it as the vagina nurturing its garden of lactobacilli mm -hmm. because that's really how how it is, which which differentiates it a bit from the gut. So there's you know it's this effort there by the body to actually create that sort of ecosystem, and this is somewhat. Um, unique to humans too, actually, when you start looking at, at other animal species that they generally will have a diverse uh, vaginal um, ecosystem. And it's only only humans that actually have have a lactobacilli dominated ecosystem. Is that right? Know, which is fascinating in itself, yes. Wow. So are we the only species? I think we are from memory, yeah. Okay, that's fascinating. It is. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, I do want to get into the lactic acid because I know how important that is. But you and you've mentioned that the vaginal microbiome differs from the gut microbiome, of course. So when, in regards to the, the food, basically, um, that's one of the, the aspects that we sort of not we, but the vaginal epithelial cells produce and yeah. uh, secrete glycogen to feed the microbes. How else does it differ from the gut microbiome? So we spoke about the, we need more of a lack of diversity rather than yeah. lots of diversity. pH is different. So we're looking for more of an acidic environment. And what else? Is there any other differences? I think those would be, I mean, obviously, even the types of lactobacilli that, yes. that dominate the vaginal ecosystem tend to be different than what we find in the gut. Um, that said, yesterday we saw, I saw you, uh, a GIT result that had a, a decent amount of L. crispatus. That was the first time I've seen that. For the most part, the vaginal um, species are, are quite separate than, from the gut bacteria. So you might have a number of lactobacilli in your gut, but they're not the same as what's actually growing in the vagina. So that's the other thing that's worth to take note. Nor are they the same that you find in fermented food. So you can't like re-inoculate the vagina with kefir or, or <laughs> sauerkraut. It's not going to work. It's, Thank it's God for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I gave a workshop on this to our uh, um, at a place where there's people who are very much, you know, I'm into fermented food too, but I just want to make that clear that you can't just, you know, re-inoculate. Those are very key, unique species with, with very unique attributes that allow them to thrive in that environment and play that protective role. And we don't get that with a, a, a strain of lactose plantarum from sauerkraut. It's not going to have the same impact in that ecosystem. Mm. And it does, the, the vaginal microbiome differs throughout a woman's life cycle, right? Did you want to expand on um, what the differences are? Yeah, so so certainly pre-puberty, it actually is quite a diverse ecosystem. And, and actually, in, and post-menopause, it becomes more diverse again. It's really when estrogen levels increase, where we get an increase in glycogen that's being produced, as well as a bit more mucus being produced. And that, that actually allows the, the lactobacilli to, to become to dominate that ecosystem so so it's very much within that that um you know fer fertile time space where lactobacilli are the dominant 
species present. Mm-hmm. And that's that when when postmenopause, when, when you know estrogen levels drop down again and there's le- less glycogen being produced, it becomes a more diverse ecosystem. And, and that's why that population has a higher risk of recurrent urinary tract infections is because there's a number of species now residing in the vagina in relatively high amounts that have the capacity to ascend the urethra and cause infection, whereas a, a vaginal dom- uh, lactobacilli dominated ecosystem doesn't have that same capacity to cause infections in the vagina or mm-hmm. in, the, in the, the urinary tract system, sorry. And so why do you think that the, um, the, the microbiome being different in that prepubescent stage serves the prepubescent person like i wonder why that is do you have any ideas around the theory around it is is around intercourse and uh, and the uh, even the idea that that why humans have a lactobacilli dominant ecosystem is because evolved because we're the arguably the only species that has sex not just to to mate but Mm. for other reasons (laughs) um and essentially that that when we start getting semen he, you know, male semen coming into the picture, which is, you know, a very alkalizing fluid. And there's also more bacteria in, in seme, a semen load than there is sperm, we now know. So it's like, yeah. it's a great capacity for that to actually alter and, and potentially pass on infectious organisms too, but also alter that pH, et cetera. So the idea with having, you know, a very lactoslide dominant ecosystem, um, it can help you know, restore the pH, help prevent any sort of back, bacteria that are that are in that load from actually being inf- causing an infection or or just altering that ecosystem to a less healthy state. Yeah. Okay. And so, and and I find I find that fascinating about the semen. And and while we're on the yeah. subject of things that can kind of, kind of alter <laughs> the vaginal microbiome and the pH yeah. and all that sort of stuff, what are some causes of vaginal dysbiosis? And and what are the? Uh, let's start with that first, and then I'd love to hear about some of the common types of vaginal dysbiosis, if we can. Yeah, I mean, it's worthwhile flowing on a bit from what we were just talking about. Then that certainly increased frequency of intercourse is a risk factor for for vag- uh, vaginal dysbiosis, mm. and that's because of those factors I've just said. That that really is an alkalizing solution being secreted in there, and there's also you know, a load of bacteria. You Multiple know, that injections once, of different bacteria. Yeah, and if that happens, you know, three times a day versus once every three days, obviously there's a, a different capacity of the, that the vaginal ecosystem to adapt and deal with that. Yeah, and and we also uh, and they're talking about obviously women that have male male partners here, and wearing a condom actually protects that the vaginal ecosystem interestingly enough as long as there's no spermicide on that, that yes. con- spermicide kills you know, the beneficial lactobacilli. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, Yes, and so spermicide use is, is 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 one of the factors that can be problematic. And certainly, what I hinted or mentioned before is that that oral or IV antibiotic use will yeah. also disrupt the vaginal ecosystem too. So yes, it causes gut dysbiosis, but vaginal dysbiosis too. And this would not be a surprise for many women who experience thrush after taking a course of antibiotics because of the disruption to that vaginal e- ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the mo- more fascinating factors, though, that causes dysbiotic environment is is cigarette smoking Mm. and it's like not kills the vaginal lactobacilli it does there are there are nicotine and nicotine byproducts or breakdown products that get secreted by vaginal epithelial cells into the vagina itself which selectively kill off your lactobacilli which i just found wow a scary thought. <laughs> yes, an absolute scary thought. For people to think about that particular impact when they're cigarette smoking, that they're actually killing bacteria in the vagina as a consequence, which is not something they would have really considered before, no. um, which is pretty fascinating. And and then some more obvious ones like the use of bidet toilets, where you know some fecal bacteria will get a bit of a wash in, into the vagina. Mm. Um, that's more obvious. But but some research showed that that topical antifungals, and I think this is again a more surprising one that people would assume that uh, I can apply this this canison or whatever antifungal, it'll kill the the yeast, but it won't bother my my good bugs. But that seems to be wrong from more recent research and stress too. So so we've known for ages that stress negatively impacts. Um, Gut bacterial, you know, beneficial microbe counts, but there's research showing that the same similar scenario happens with vaginal lactobacilli too. The counts go down when exposed to high amounts of stress, and that sadly is is too much. That for a component of many of our lives these days. And I should also flag vaginal washing or douching, which thankfully is not that common in in Australia or where we practice. But uh, I know in, in in America it's actually quite a common practice. And, and that causes, even if it's just water, let alone with soap or shampoo or um, perfume <laughs> that I've mm. read about, we're actually using, which causes massive disruption to the ecosystem. Do you remember baby powder? 
Yeah. Do people still use it? Actually, yes. I did see someone in the local supermarket purchase. It was a male, actually, purchase the, the Johnson & Johnson baby powder. And yeah. I just thought, I remember the days that my mother would say, put that in your pants. <laughs> and it would be like this thing that you yeah. would just do for feminine hygiene. Yeah, yeah. That's right. The whole aisle of feminine hygiene products. It's just like, mm. really? Yeah. It's, it's not even just like not needed, but it's harmful. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I want, because I know that you spoke a little bit about the vaginal glitter bombs, which I just think are just hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> Your course, that people would develop something like this that would make the vagina smell a certain way and look glittery and, uh, and taste it, sweet. And taste sweet. Yes. Yeah. But so, what are your thoughts on, say, th- some of those practices like the vaginal steam baths using organic dried herbs? Yeah, I, I would think they're less likely to be nearly <laughs> as problematic as those like glitter bombs. Which oh, are, for you know, sure. Classic, I'm not comparing it. Classic. Absolutely yeah, not. No, no, I just thought you'd just like that. <laughs> Make sure I clearly reiterate that. Um, and I also think it's because it's, it's it'll generally be, be around the outs, more around the labia and that lower area, which I think it will have less of a chance of impacting um, the deeper ecosystem. And, and I think that's where the douching, et cetera, becomes far more problematic is, you know, there's, you know, essentially changing the pH of the environment or introducing, you know, soapy things to wash away bacteria deep into the vagina, not just at that outer labia area. Mm. And what about the otherwise known as yoni eggs? What are your thoughts on those sticking those little, um, different, like the obsidian they, eggs and the problematic actually, okay, because they're great. Not gonna, I mean, if they're, if they're, if the same woman uses it and it and it has some vaginal lactobacilli on it and and some stick on there after the you know washing process afterwards, um, that's not that's not going to be problematic reintroducing lactobacilli back into that that ecosystem you know so I think that obviously if you you could consider ways in which you know if people were were sharing them or something like that where oh god probably, hopefully they're not, not the sharing them <laughs> so so if it's just used the way that they're typically used then I wouldn't expect it to be a problem okay. Good, good to know, good to know. And um, so what are the common types of vaginal dysbiosis? I mean, I think the two that probably have the biggest um, bearing on, on women's health would be bacterial vaginosis. Um, I suppose that community state, state type four that is asymptomatic dysbiosis, mm. whereas mm. bacterial vaginosis is essentially a similar ecosystem, but women have symptoms for the most part. So they'll they make it a, you know, a fishy smell. Um, they might have itchiness, a, a bit of redness, but a little bit of discharge. But bacterial vaginosis is often misdiagnosed as, as thrush or candida as well. So, so we know that bacterial vaginosis is actually more common than thrush, but it's often di- misdiagnosed as, as thrush. Mm. Um, and then B group strep, uh, which can be a symptomatic um, scenario where it actually causes symptoms and, and, and tissue damage in, in some women, although it's, I'd say it's relatively rare. Other women, it'll be asymptomatic and still make up, had a patient where it made up 80 some percent of that ecosystem, but they had no, no vaginal symptoms. Um, but the, the biggest issue with that is really around um, pregnancy and birth, where it really needs to be flagged. Um, and if we can find out that it's there beforehand, hopefully we can actually change things around. And also too, whether it's there at 1% of an ecosystem or 80% of an ecosystem um, has a big difference in terms of what we'd expect with the chance of, uh, you know, premature birth and premature rupture of the membranes and other issues that we sometimes see associated with, with heart or, you know, a positive B group strep. You're just really making, you're stating it, um, your case for it being a big part of uh, preparation for um, pregnancy. I tell you. It's yeah, strange that it's not. I I totally hear you on, on that one, and and also because of the the improved um, IVF outcomes that we see with women that have crispatus dominant ecosystems. For me, it's just like, why is this not like a standard thing we do for for all women that that you know that are having you know aren't falling pregnant as quickly as they 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 should in quotation mark be that we should be looking at, okay, this test, obviously this diet and nutritional things, et cetera, that, that naturopaths and nutritionists are um, very well trained and versed in for looking at, but we're not so well trained at looking at the general ecosystem and nor are there your typical gynae either for that, that matter that they're often not paying any attention to that at all because it's not part of their, their way of looking at things either. Mm, and especially with, especially when you were saying with the bacterial vaginosis that, um, you know, it, it can, 50% can be asymptomatic yeah. and it typically can be without the inflammation and redness. Exactly. So, you know, 
it, it would be quite easily missed if um, these sort of forms of testing to assess for that weren't done. Yeah, because that's the thing. If it was always symptomatic, it would be far less of an issue because most women, not all, but most women would go and get things checked out when symptoms occurred. But when it's 50% it's completely asymptomatic, but it's associated with these adverse health outcomes, it's like the only way we find it is by testing. Mm. And you mentioned that it reoccurs frequently post-antibiotics. Is that right? Yeah, because obviously conventional medicine, their their the typical approach is to treat it like uh, like they do for most infectious type conditions. It's just mm. that it's not a classic infection in that it's it's a bacterial imbalance. You know, so often when we're treating pneumonia or something like that, it's one bacterial species that's rampant that we'll just tar- tar- try our best to target <laughs> and kill off, and then mm. yeah. In this case, we just have an imbalance of a number of different species, uh, which in, in some cases causes symptoms, some cases not in terms of acute symptoms. Um, but yeah, it, the, the rate of, of you know, a return of bacterial vaginosis is extremely high. And that can be, I think, about maybe two thirds of women on average within four to six weeks will have a return of that bacterial vaginosis ecosystem because it's antibiotics aren't normalizing or, or no. optimizing that ecosystem. They're just reducing levels of certain microbes. Um, and that's for most women, isn't enough to to restore it or optimize that ecosystem. Mm, yeah, yeah. Look, it makes total sense. And you said, I think, ne- nearly 70% will have a uh, return within 90 yeah. days. It's scary. It's just huge, huge yeah. recurrence. And, and it just shows that that approach that is commonly used is not a good approach, not a, not a, actually all that, that uh, good. Uh, um, no. I, I, that's not a good outcome for, for a treatment that has, you know, other, other you know, negative consequences like damage to the gut ecosystem too as a consequence. So, Yeah, it's just like a bad haircut that gets keeps getting worse and worse. <laughs> Try to repair it. Uh, yeah. Anyway, bad, bad analogy, but uh, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> So um, what does it, I want to know more about the leaky vagina. We've all heard about the leaky gut. So, but there is a term called the leaky vagina. So what does it mean? And what are the consequences yeah. of having a leaky vagina? They don't, it doesn't well, sound too pleasant, does it? It doesn't. Um, yeah, it was, it was interesting because I, I was preparing for a lecture. I was presenting at a conference in Sydney earlier this year, and I was reading through, you know, updating my, my knowledge on this on this area, and they kept talking about, like, sort of lack of, of a integrity of the cervical epithelial cells um, just kept coming up again with, with having a dysbiotic ecosystem. I was just, you know, because they were always thinking of that similar thing happening in the gut when we have a dysbiotic thing and then we've got a leaky gut. It was just like... This, they're talking about a leaky vagina. They haven't phrased it like that. But, mm. you know, we talk about a late, leaky blood-brain barrier and a leaky gut. And that's really what we're talking about is, is the, essentially a lack of integrity of those cervical ep- vaginal epithelial cells. And when we have that lack of, of integrity, it means that there's a greater risk of acquisition of SDIs, including, you know, HIV and HPV and obviously cervical cancer as a consequence. And, and arguably, there's a lot more to that, including things like endometriosis and, and other it just uh, a greater inflammatory milieu in that woman that comes from having essentially that sort of lack of integrity that's allowing bacterial byproducts through mm-hmm. and bacteria and viruses through. And that's a similar thing that we know that the leaky gut has has consequences for letting in bacterial byproducts that you know, lead to, to fatty liver. And, and we're now looking at things like anxiety and depression being tied into this too. And I think, gosh, you know, we have a similar scenario happening in the vagina too, where these bacterial byproducts, as well as actual bacteria and viruses are, are penetrating through um, and getting into the system. And, and it wouldn't surprise me with research thesis that's out as actually being one of the, a, one of the key drivers of something like endometriosis, which, which is an extremely common condition these days. Mm, absolutely. So, so some of the big drivers to, you know, getting a leaky vagina would be like chronic reoccurrent um, microbiome dysbiosis, vaginal microbiome dysbiosis. Essentially, it's an ecosystem type that is not dominated by by Chris uh, or Jensenii or Gasserii, the ones that produce delactate and enough lactic acid. That's the, the key thing because we know that the the polymicrobial you know, asymptomatic dysbiosis picture, it's not very acidic. And lactic acid is, is essentially the key factor that actually allows vaginal epithelial cells to, to function properly and to heal up properly and for the, um, you know, he, healing process to work properly. And even for the mucus to trap, the, you know, the protective mucus in there, if we get enough, the pH goes low enough and we have some delactic there, it actually traps viruses and bacteria far better than if it's not. Mm. If it's L lactate, or if it's um, the pH actually changes, so that's the the key thing is that you know, the 
because then that allows those things, those pathogens to come through and interact with epithelial cells and cause inflammation and cause greater leakiness. And, and the lactic acid sort of turns off some of those pro-inflammatory cascades that can happen even when that uh, process is started off. So why else do we love lactic acid? You've mentioned it a few times now, and I know that we it's so um, required in the vagina for as a, as a bacteriocide and a viricide and um, anti-inflammatory agent, as you've mentioned, uh, in, inhibits pro-inflammatory mediators and all that sort of stuff. Are there any other yeah. reasons why we love it so much? But I think we've covered it pretty, pretty well. <laughs> Those but, are pretty but big in terms reasons. Of like, you know, things like SDRs, like chlamydia and gonorrhea, um, uropathogenic E. coli, the one that causes urinary tract infections, that all, they all die when exposed to a pH of less than 4.5. Mm. with enough lactic acid there so i mean that's just the key the key things to remember is but if the ph goes to 4.6 or 4.7 let alone five or above you're not getting any sort of um, inhibitory effect against those those organisms that will otherwise you know take reside and cause harm and symptoms Mm. It really is different from, from most part of the body, especially the gut and, and other areas. When you think of lactic acid, people necessarily, they, they kind of link it to muscles and soreness and yeah. you know, build up and let's not create too much of it. And Whereas in this scenario, it's like, yes, how can we create more lactic acid? Lactic yeah, acid well, it's is a like good thing. Vaginal epithelial cells, like we've evolved reliant on that production because there's only a small amount that's actually produced by vaginal cells themselves, and they rely on bacterial production of that for it to function properly to, you know, it enhances DNA and cellular repair in those those cell types, and it's reliant upon that. So there are consequences when it's not getting that food, essentially, mm-hmm. and that happens with, with that, you know, polymicrobial, you know, asymptomatic scenario. It happens in bacterial vaginosis, and that lactose inner is, dominated ecosystem which is you know maybe 34 percent of the population again is asymptomatic but they're not getting enough of the lactic acid being produced to get the benefits and for the to protect against that sort of leaky vagina scenario mm. now i know people are probably chomping at the bit to go how the hell do i test how do we assess the vaginal health do you want to shed some light on that what sort of tools do we have at the moment yeah, and I, we discussed one tool earlier that i think is just worth flagging again but a, a simple P, a T, ph test strip that has the right measures on it that's the other thing i should mention too mm. because the, most of the ones you can find in the market are looking at saliva or urine ph and they have you know between one in 14 or you know six to eight on it which is completely useless for assessing the vaginal ecosystem because you really want to have gradients between like three and a half and five and a half or something like that ideally i mean they're not that easy to come by in australia again sadly enough that it's actually hard to to get the right tools to even just do a simple um health screen about checking the vaginal pH of, of patients, you know, um, we have, like my clinic, we bring them in, we have to order the kids in from Germany, <laughs> which is just crazy. Mm. It's this very simple, simple process. But yeah, is that so, where so you pH, buy them? Is that Germany or you? Ah, okay. No, that's, getting... that's different. I'm looking more broadly. Ah, like okay. This is just a pH test strip that's designed to, to assess vaginal pH acidity. Cause right. it's got the right. I was going to ask you, what's your favorite pH strip? Like what brand, but if you, you need to get it from Germany, do you? Yeah. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but I know there's other places like from eBay, et cetera, that people are buying them yeah. from, but it's just, you can't just buy it from a supplier here in Australia. You used to be able to, but they stopped making them, which was frustrating. Mm-hmm. Um, so pH is, is certainly a very quick and easy way of assessing, you know, so, so a pH of less than 4.5 doesn't guarantee that you've got a, you know, that there's not candida or other things that are present, but it does tell you that at least you've got a good amount of lactic acid there and you, and you don't have bacterial vaginosis. That's the key thing. And if it, but a pH of less than four or greater than that, so more alkaline than 4.5, so 4.6 or 7 or 5 or 6.5 or 7, something like that tells you that you have a dysbiotic ecosystem and there's mm-hmm. nowhere near enough lactobacilli or lactic acid being produced to get the benefits that we've been talking about now. So I think a pH is a great initial screen. Um, from and could, could, Conventional medicine up to this point is, tends to use culturing. So they sort of take a, take a swab and they sort of grow it out and you get an idea and they look at it and go, okay, well, how many, you know, gram positive rods are there versus sort of gram negative or gram mixed <laughs> gram species and they kind of come up with a, an idea of okay yeah you've got bacterial vaginosis etc but it doesn't tell us details on the community state types if it tells you that lactobacilli are there or you get a vague you know three plus or two plus whereas nowadays you can use these molecular assessments and we've talked about this uh, but the importance of looking at using those techniques for gut, it's a similar thing if you want a really good picture of the vaginal ecosystem in terms of the species that are present and the spread of those species and exactly which lactobacilli dominate rather than just 
lactobacilli, it's like, no, which species? I want to make sure it's crispatus. Then you have to use molecular assessments to do so. And, and again, in, in Australia, we're, we're behind the times and don't have an easy way of actually doing this. But there, there is, you know, Ubiome in the U.S. that, that are often used for gut assessments that also will, will assess vaginal ecosystems too. And it's brilliant when you get the results back and go, ah, okay, you're, you're actually 82% streptococci. <laughs> it's B root mm. strep. And this is, you know, just before pregnancy. That's an important thing to know. Um, and, or I had another patient that was 98% lactose crispatus. And you're like, yes, wow. perfect. Mm. Um, that, that's the great state to go into when you're, you know, going, going to the stage of wanting to become pregnant. So I think it should be part of that um, uh, broader screen for probably all women. Um, but it should certainly be part of that screen for, for women going into that, you know, wanting to get pregnant phase because we certainly do a lot with let's build up your nutrition let's take these different vitamins and take this particular type of folate etc cetera, etc cetera. but we tend to ignore that ecosystem which is a, a key factor in, in in fertility outcomes and birth outcomes too for that matter mm, a massive factor and and is that the vaginal explorer that you would use at yes. Ubiome? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so the U.S. practitioners get access to the the Smart Jane, which is which looks for disease agents and H, HPV types, etc. It's a pretty cool test. But as an Australian, Australians, we don't have access to that. But the the Vaginal Explorer, which comes as part of their five site kit, which is again another another bit of a hassle to actually get it, um, means that we can get that that beautiful picture of what the ecosystem looks like. Mm. And yes, I call out to everyone that. Uh, <laughs> has a path lab or some sort of laboratory that might be able to do a vaginal microbiome um, assessment tool thing for us, that would be amazing. It would. (laughs) It would be absolutely fantastic. You'd be the leader at that front bit of the wave, um, which because as I said, I'm I'm sure in 10 years this is going to be common practice by both, you know, natural medicine practitioners but also um, conventional medicine too because the research is building up to the point where it's hard to ignore. And and I'm sure that I'm sure that it would. I think as a practitioner, once you start to really truly understand how important these things are to assess, yeah. then you want it like yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> you want yeah, it, you want it right it's, now because you know how much it can really like support they're, your they're, treatments. Yeah, it's it's ignorance. It's not like they're they're like I'm ignoring that. It's just I don't know it exists. And you start looking at, at it and delving into it. You're like, oh, actually, this is really important. Mm-hmm. Oh, we need to be doing this as a screening test for all of our female patients because this has got to do with optimizing their health. Yes. Full stop. Absolutely. So what have you found going to going into treatment? What have you found to be extremely useful in the treatment of vaginal microbiome dysbiosis, such as things like bacterial vaginosis? Yeah. So with bacterial vaginosis, you know, it's best not to think of it as an infection, more of a dysbiotic environment. So we think, how do we improve, you know, just like a gut ecosystem, how do we actually improve the, the, the spread of different species? How do we encourage the growth of certain species? And that's the way we look at it. Because if you look at a, a, a bacterial vaginosis result, there'll be lactobacilli there. They're just there in teeny tiny amounts of like you know, 1% or 2%. Um, and it's like, okay, well, how do we specifically increase levels of that species? And that, that comes to do with, with prebiotics. And prebiotics we talked about at length last time, but they're selectively fermented substrates that are, can only be utilized by certain beneficial species. Um, so it's like a selective fertilizer. And luckily we sort of know, okay, we've got – lactobacilli that's what we want to want to fertilize um and we know prebiotics that that do that and and there's been some fascinating research studies that have come over the last couple of years but i must say i've been using vaginal prebiotics in my patients for probably 15 years um and particularly one called lactulose um lactulose we know is a gut prebiotic that feeds lactobacilli great that's what we need so i've been using it for you know thrush patients and bacterial vaginosis patients for for as i said over a decade but there's a very cool study that came out um just in the last 12 months that was looking at the potential of, of gut prebiotics to work as vaginal prebiotics and they pick lactulose as their top top one and i was like yes mm, great a bit of a hero product right for along. the vagina isn't it yeah because it feeds every single strain of lactulose crispatus loved lactulose and it can't be utilized as a food source by candida or the bacterial vaginosis microbes so it won't work even though it's sweet and tastes like sugar and looks like sugar it doesn't feed the bugs we don't want it mm. feeds up lactobacilli specifically and especially L. crispatus blood. Yes. And that's the that's the definition of a prebiotic, the selectiveness of exactly. um, what it feeds. Yeah, because people get lost and they always go, oh, it just feeds bacteria. It's like, no, that's yeah. not a prebiotic. It chooses prebiotic who it decides to feed. <laughs> yeah, 
that's right. Um, and, and that fits the bill. And there's, there's other research going on with, you know, glucooligosaccharides and glu- uh, glucomannan, for example, that comes from the cognac route that's had some preliminary good results with normalizing that vaginal ecosystem too. Um, and I've used that in practice as well, but I've used certainly more, more lactulose than anything else. So yes, the vaginal prebiotics, um, the vaginal probiotics too. And in this case, we're after probiotic strains with different characteristics than we are for treating H. pylori infection or um, IBS. Because we want them to have different attributes and different traits. We want them to be able to, you know, you know, attach to epithelial cells in the jana. We want them to sort of compete with pathogens. We want them to ideally secrete a compound that sort of breaks down um, pathogen uh, biofilm or mm-hmm. and get pathogens directly. So we're, we're looking at different traits altogether. And luckily, there's other researchers that have been doing that too. And, and you know, ones like Gregor Reed, that was probably the pioneer of looking at vaginal um, probiotics, who, who's developed, you know, probiotic preparation that's pretty widely available around the world these days um back in the from research went off the, from the middle and early 1990s you know and probably 15 years of research before it ever was ever commercialized but that's the l remnosis gr1 and l um fermentum rc14 mm. strains used in, in that combination have now a number of studies showing that they're helpful for the treatment of bacterial vaginosis mm, so they're the most researched um yes yeah, and I had there'll be more to look forward to. There's there's other strains. You can actually get crispata strains in the market in in Europe and in North America, but sadly not here. Mm. So you've mentioned some of the properties like infiltrating the biofilms and and you know inhibiting gram positive um, uh, bacteria and all that sort of stuff. And why would the production of hydro- hydrogen peroxide be beneficial? Um, you've mentioned with the lactobacillus fermentum. RC14 that it can produce hydrogen peroxide. I think this is yeah, the because yes, because hydrogen peroxide is a, a substance which which lactobacilli tend to tolerate pretty well, but but pathogens don't. So mm. you know the, the bugs involved with bacterial vaginosis don't tolerate um, hydrogen peroxide well at all. In fact, there's a couple of clinical trials using hydrogen peroxide as a you know dilute as a rinse or douche for bacterial vaginosis with one with repeat um, uses outstanding results as well so that's one of the other agents i use in my bacterial vaginosis patients too is as a way of normalizing that ecosystem because here you do have a selectively acting antimicrobial that leaves your lactose alone but gets rid of the microbes you don't want in the vagina and that's hydrogen peroxide so it one sounds of the very harsh for the poor vagina the, the hydrogen peroxide yeah <laughs> sounds like um, hair dye <laughs> fair question um and it's one Lacking vagina myself is not something I've had a chance to experiment with because I like doing that with most treatments that I give to yes. patients. I'll try, I'll try them on myself first, but I couldn't in this case. But um, I did have some you know, naturopathic colleagues who were willing experimentees when that research first came out of going, okay, well, it's similar thought to running through our heads. And like, okay, well, let's just trial it out. It's a 3% dilution. Um, about 20 mils. And we've worked out that majority of, of women over years of practice actually tolerate that quite fine, even though John is mildly irritated. But there's a percentage that actually caused, you know, quite severe pain for you know, a number of minutes, which is obviously not what we're after. So these days, like, we tend to dilute it down to, you know, a third of that. So maybe a 1% solution for the first couple of days to see how the treatment goes, then move up towards the, the 3% dilution, which is what was used in the clinical trial. And with the lactulose, going back to that though, do you always do it um, intravaginally, like via a spray or a syringe, or do you do it um, orally as well when it comes to treating the the vaginal? Do you do them both, like both or just well, either? Well, the reality is I'm probably often doing them both, but yeah. I think directly direct application to the vagina is is really the core aspect of, of normalizing that providing a, a good quantity of that food source because very little uh, uh, none of that lactose is going to make its way into the vagina from oral use but it will increase levels of you know lactose lye and and bifidobacteria etc in the gut which you know we, we just see is associated with beneficial outcomes and potentially reduce levels of things like candida and e coli for example mm-hmm. so someone that had recurrent utis then i'd certainly be using lactulose orally and intravaginally as well mm. And the same goes for the, the, the hydro, hydrogen peroxide would be obviously just use intra, intravaginally rather yeah. than you wouldn't even go near doing orally. No, no that's yeah. right. <laughs> Green tea I thought was an interesting one as a um, yeah. vaginal prebiotic. How would you, uh, you know, how, would, how does it work as a, a vaginal prebiotic and like what are the great properties that you find with green tea and um, how would you actually utilize that on a woman? 
Yeah, we sometimes forget how how cool some of the things are that are just around us all the time. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Just see this as like a beverage that you drink. It's, you know, we know it's a bit healthy, but we don't know we associate all the, the wonderful health benefits we get from green tea and the, the, the attributes that it has. But but again, it, it seems to have a, a prebiotic-like effect, so it feeds up lactobacilli populations because they can eat the, the polyphenols in, in, in the green tea. And the polyphenols are what makes your mouth pucker the tanniny sort of bits in green tea. So the longer you let that tea brew, the more tannins you actually get. Now, the, the polyphenols in green tea are also good at killing off microbes we don't want, including things like Candida, E. coli, Bacteroides, things that we don't want growing in the vagina. Um, some cool research showing that the green tea polyphenols break down established biofilm, um, prevent the development of new biofilm as well. Um, so you're looking at that. Again, a very selectively acting antimicrobial. Mm. Just what we need in this situation, something that will at the very least leave lactobacilli alone. But in this case, and with with um, the hydrogen peroxide we're getting, or that's what's a little bit different. Hydrogen peroxide leaves the lactobacilli alone, but in this case, green tea actually increases lactobacilli, but but damages the other bugs we don't want there. So so perfect. So you know, I've certainly had uh, women apply it in a few different ways, from just making a strong cup of green tea, allowing it to sit to cool, and they can use that as a as a douche, or they can put it into a spray bottle and spray. And you can also even add some lactulose to that green tea, um, and then you've got a double cocktail. Tea. Yeah. So would you recommend, I mean, would it be of benefit for, say, just your average woman that's not necessarily wanting to fall pregnant or doesn't really mm. feel as though anything's going on for them at the moment to do like an occasional green tea spray or rinse? Uh, it's, it's a good question. And I think I'd probably prefer to do a, a, like a pH test strip first yes. and going, okay, um, as a general screen, because you may not. You might be one of that, that one in four women that have a beautiful crispatostone ecosystem, in which case... Don't want to mess with it. Yeah, yeah, there's no point messing with it. You're not gonna, you've are not you got perfection. There's no point trying yes. to change that. Um, but if you, if you, if you don't, then, then yes, then, then there would be, uh, you know, if your vaginal pH is out of whack, then, then there's certainly um, a, a safe way of actually trying to alter that ecosystem. It's obviously better working with a practitioner, ideally, who's got experience using it and can fine-tune the doses, etc. But it's certainly... Um, not the same as using shampoo or feminine hygiene products, mm. which you know might make it smell like perfume, but actually kills the beneficial things. We're looking at something that actually will help normalize and optimize the ecosystem. Beautiful. So we spoke about uh, your probiotics, your prebiotics, um, you know, your things like lactulose and green tea. What about some other things? I know you've mentioned garlic, which I also found interesting. Yeah, and we might use garlic more for not so much with bacterial vaginosis, but for B group strep. Right. Yeah, so that's one of the, the few herbs. And, and again, for women with B group strep, I'd suggest dealing, working with a practitioner with experience um, working with that bug, particularly during pregnancy, but even even outside that, because there's a range of herbs we know that have activity against that that species. So it's, it's really trying to target as best as possible with, without damaging your, your good guys as much as possible. But, but garlic would fit that category too, because uh, I certainly did research as part of my PhD, looking at the antimicrobial spread of, of garlic in terms of what good guys did it sort of impact and lactobacilli were fairly resistant to garlic, even in pretty high concentrations, which is great, but it's, it's, it's very effective at getting rid of um, B group strep. Beautiful. Anything else of it for bacterial vaginosis? Uh, certainly, there's been some research using vitamin C topically as well. Um, again, it's about, about changing that acidity, and, and um, I suppose it's using you know ascorbic acid instead of lactic acid. And I think in some parts of the world, they actually have preparations made from lactic acid, so you can actually use that as, as a rinse for the vagina too, so I could see the benefit of that, but I'm not sure how often easily available they are here. Um, and those are probably the main ones that I've used in practice. Mm-hmm. But there are... are others <laughs> oh well if it works why would you go yeah why would you try yeah, anything yeah, else right. unless something is just magical that you're you're very interested in and you might give it a go but i think you know flatulose is a bit of a hero product and these two um probiotic strains work really well then yeah use them absolutely yeah it works it works in most women that and the hydrogen peroxide would certainly be my my most used combination or agents in bacterial vaginosis with generally very good results and i've had a look at your the the website the probiotics advisor which i love by the way everyone go and check it out for you practitioners out there um looking for those particular strains in australia do you have you found there to be one i couldn't i don't think there was one where they were both together 
Uh, there is. There's there's the Blackmore's um, Women's Biobalance. Bio Balance, and that's been on the market for a couple of couple of years. And I know Biomedic in Australia the has recently Femics. brought up two. Yeah. Okay. So those those two have got the combination strains that we're after, which is which is great. So and I was so happy to see them here. Yes. <laughs> so I was like reading the research for like years and years going when are they going to reach the market when are they coming out being immensely frustrated and then then they're out in the states and that was still frustrating because they're like damn they're on the market but nobody here has actually made a move to get them and then they have thankfully so so we now can access them which is fantastic fantastic and is there anything else that you'd like to bring to light about the vaginal microbiome and the vaginal ecosystem overall that's either fascinating or you'd love for us to know as women as and and also as yeah. practitioners I think it's just being aware of its importance and, and just because you're not getting symptoms doesn't mean that the ecosystem is in, is in a healthy state. I think those are the, some of the main points I'd like to get across and, and how easy it is to just implement a simple pH testing program with your patients um, to just get an idea of, of whether that ecosystem dysbiosis might be contributing to, to, to their ill health in many ways. Because just think again, but a leaky vagina, increasing the inflammatory milieu in the system and, you know, what diseases do we not associate with, with inflammation these days? So we might have a, an avenue of, of, of inflammation in this woman that we just hadn't thought of because it's, it's not, they're not complaining. There's no symptoms, but it should be on our radar and we should be looking at it. Absolutely. And it should absolutely be part of our preconception testing yes. and care and all that sort of stuff. It's just highly important, I think. I'm certainly going to jump off here and do a bit of investigation for myself. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so my final question to you, which I like to ask all of my guests, is has there been a book or a movie that has had much impact in your life that you can think of quickly and why? Yeah, um, I think these days most of what I read when I'm not doing work is actually like fantasy novels, and and most of what I watch is sort of like sci-fi films because it just takes me completely out of out of this reality because I'm so you know spending time in the research, spending time seeing patients and treating patients. Yeah, that when I'm on my off time, what I want to do is just not be. If you know what I mean, I want to be somewhere else for that time. Um, yeah, and, and certainly I can think of when I was a kid that the, I'll be a bit of a nerd, but the Star Wars trilogy when I was a kid had huge impact on on me. Um, yeah, just the, all the talk about the the, the Force essentially. Yes. Um, and some of that, you know, I remember watching some bits of that even now when I watch The Empire Strikes Back when you know Yoda and and Luke Skywalker are talking in the swamp and there's a scene that gets all these sp- tingles at my spine when Yoda's speaking about the the life force. Yeah. So mm, I love I'll put it. that in that category. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And, and you know, there's always something in it for children and adults in those sort of yeah. sci-fi um, mystery sort of movies and, and everything, which I love. Even if you go back and listen to it, it's like, oh, aha, uh-huh. it still lands with me. It still has much impact. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. And where can people find you? And tell us a little bit about your course. So you've, as I mentioned, I've done your vaginal microbiome part one course and hang in for the second. I cannot wait. Loved it as, devoured (laughs) it and loved it (laughs) as usual. So that's available to practitioners now. Can, it's only available to practitioners. Is that right? Well, it's, it's aimed for practitioners. So there's nothing stopping health conscious individuals who want to learn more about that ecosystem from, from learning more. Yeah. We're not going to stop you because I think it's an important empowering step. But obviously, the the terminology is such that it's aimed for for practitioners. That's that's our target audience, um, and who I'm, I I do the most of my teaching with. Um, yes, but I think uh, as we said, it's an important ecosystem. <laughs> it shouldn't be neglected anymore, and we start need to start thinking about it. So that's really what was my main driver of of getting that course out there because it gives it the opportunity of, of upskilling people in that area because it wasn't part of my naturopathic training. We didn't touch on the general ecosystems besides disease states at all, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of what was health, what was optimal health. It was not talked about, um, and, and it really needs to be. And the reality is it's only really gone a little bit mainstream in the last year or so, so it's not really – like it's just all – quite it's evolving um you know but it has been necessary for a long time and what i will say about your course though that um yes it is designed for the practitioner but even if a um a woman would like to to have that education behind them it invites them to have that conversation with their integrated gp or their you know 
normal G- normal GP or even their functional health practitioner to say, look, what about this vaginal microbiome thing? I heard it's important. <laughs> Should yeah, I do yeah. a pH test? So I, I think that that's huge. That's a huge thing because that's how practitioners start learning is when patients start asking them questions. <laughs> as mm. well. It puts them on the spot like, oh, I don't want to be on that spot again. I better do yes. some background learning on that area. So I, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yes. Yeah, I agree. So you and I think it's empowering in. for the, for the um, – yeah person because it's like it like me or you know going to a mechanic and having no idea and feeling you're at the complete mercy of yeah. your mechanic yeah. so having that knowledge to go hang on a second something's not quite right have we looked at the vaginal microbiome yes. maybe we should so yeah. yeah beautiful and how else can people find you yeah, so, so they can certainly find me on the probiotic advisor and i'm also a clinician at, at gould's natural medicine which is a clinic in hobart beautiful and you've got a couple of talks coming up I do. I'm speaking at the Australian Naturopathic Summit in Lennox Head in a couple of weeks, Beautiful. Um, which is exciting. And then I'm speaking in, in the UK the weekend after that at, in, in Brighton talking about home medicines and their impact on the gut microbiome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is exciting. And then I'm doing a, a, a web, webinar series for a U, UK group called In Vivo, um, which is sort of a gut masterclass. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Yeah, which includes the bacterial vaginosis course and, and more. Yeah. Mm, will you make that available to us? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it certainly is. It, it, in vivo is a UK based company, so they're mostly targeting there, but anyone from around the world is welcome to, to enroll. Beautiful. I'll have a look out for that. Well, thank you so much for joining me yet again. I always learn so much from you, Jason, and I always value your time. So thank you so much for shedding, sharing and shedding your wisdom on us. You're very welcome. And it's wonderful <laughs> connecting again. I always enjoy our chats too, Linda. Thanks, Jason. And as always, guys, if you've enjoyed what you've heard today, make sure that you share it with at least one other person you know will benefit and leave a ratings and review on iTunes so that others can enjoy the content too. Thank you for making it to the very end of this podcast episode. Just one more thing before you go, though. If you're tired of having sluggish digestion that leaves you feeling bloated, toxic, flatulent, flat, or if you suspect that you may have SIBO, please do get in contact. You don't have to live with these discomforts. I've seen many people transform simply by seeking the support of a qualified clinician such as myself. So please do get in contact as I would love to help you obtain your optimum health. My naturopathic and nutrition consultations are run online, which means if you're located anywhere in Australia, I can work with you. You can book a consultation directly online. Simply go to my website, lindagripridge.com, go to the book an appointment page or send me an email at info at lindagripridge.com. And if you're unsure whether seeing a holistic practitioner is right for you, schedule in a complimentary 15-minute Q&A session with me where you get the opportunity to ask how my consultations are run and what to expect from my treatment plans. Again, simply go to my website, go to the book a consultation page and you will find the tab there.